Scientific knowledge is the highest attainment upon the human plane, for science is a discoverer of realities. It is of two kinds, material and spiritual. Material science is the investigation of natural phenomena. Divine science is a discovery and realization of spiritual verities. The world of humanity must acquire both. A bird has two wings. It cannot fly with one. Material and spiritual science are the two wings of human uplift and attainment. Both are necessary, one the natural, the other supernatural, one material, the other divine. Abdul Baha. Furthermore, religion must conform to reason and be in accord with the conclusions of science. For religion, reason and science are realities. Therefore, these three being realities must conform and be reconciled. A question or principle which is religious in its nature must be sanctioned by science. Science must declare it to be valid and reason must confirm it in order that it may inspire confidence. Abdu'l-Baha. This week, we're really happy to have Dr. Kendall Williams and his topic is religion and science as two keys to reality. Dr. Kendall Williams is a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the editor of the Baha'i website, sifterofdust.org. He studied at Haverford College before attending Penn Medical School and then completed his residency and chief residency at the University of Pittsburgh before returning to Penn as faculty. He's a general internist by training and the founding director of the Penn Center for Evidence-Based Practice. He's now the host of the Penn Primary Care Podcast and continues to perform clinical work and teach at Penn. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Williams. Thank you, Paimane. Um, so thank you all uh, for uh, taking the time to log on to listen to my presentation. Um, this is, um, I, I think this is a really important topic. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna do it justice. I'm gonna give my own personal perspective on it. There's much to be said. Uh, you know, uh, I'd say that most of the people of the world nowadays, when they um, think about knowledge, they think about science. Um, we used to think about that in terms of religion, but most of the people of the world, I think, um, increasingly come to understanding religion with a scientific background. And so that's the prism through which we uh, judge things. Uh, and so any religion that claims truth, I think has to claim it within the context of science. So, um, I wanted to talk about, from a Baha'i perspective, how those, um, these two aspects are connected, how the Baha'i faith unites these two aspects of our reality and, and creates, I think, a holistic picture of reality. Let me start by the basic truths of the Baha'i faith. So the Baha'i faith is a re religion, a revelation. Baha'u'llah claimed to be revealing a revelation from God in the same manner that the prophet Muhammad revealed Islam and Jesus revealed the religion of Christianity and Moses revealed the um, portions of the Hebrew Bible and so forth. It's a it's belief in a revelation from God. And Baha'u'llah uh, appeared in um, and lived his life in the 1800s uh, in the Middle East, uh, declaring his mission in 1863. Uh, Baha'u'llah's teachings and his revelation are the most remarkable thing you will ever know, I think. Uh, they're absolutely majestic, uh, universal. Baha'u'llah revealed the most universal religion that humanity has ever known. Uh, it's a very significant thing, and I hope those of you who haven't had an opportunity to study it will do so. Um, Baha'u'llah taught that there is one God who is the ultimate source of all reality, and that the great religions of humankind, rather than being separate, are actually have all come from the same God, a reflection of the divine will, but because the world was always changing and evolving, the revelations of God also change and adapt their standards to the age in which they appear. So this is an evolutionary view of religion that views the world as a dynamic and creative place, uh, which I think is very important when we start to think about science. Baha'u'llah revealed a religion that he claimed represents the standards of God for our time in, in history. And the central principle of that religion is the oneness of humankind. So um, there's a beautiful quote of Baha'u'llah that speaks to the founders of the great religions. And he says that every one of them 
is the way of God that connects this world with the realms above and the standard of his truth unto every everyone in the kingdoms of earth and heaven. He referred to what other religions refer to as messengers of God or prophets of God. He referred to them as the manifestations of God because they manifest the qualities of God to human beings. He said they are the manifestations of God amidst men, the evidences of his truth and the signs of his glory. So the religions of humanity represent successive stages in sort of the manifestation of God's will to humanity and actually are the clearest evidence of God's truth. I gave a talk about this a little while ago that's on the site um, that you're welcome to look to. But this is a very significant quote of Baha'u'llah. He said, oh, well, beloved ones, that's everybody. Baha'u'llah speaks with the voice of God throughout his writings. He said, the tabernacle of unity has been raised. Regard you not one another as strangers. You are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. And so Baha'u'llah taught that what God wants is for everyone to see each other as part of this one beautiful tree of humanity, all the diverse colors and aspects of, of what we are as a human race. But then he also says something very significant. He said, verily I say, whatsoever leads to the decline of ignorance and the increase of knowledge hath been and will ever remain approved in the sight of the Lord of creation. So for Baha'is, the, the um, producing knowledge, increasing knowledge uh, is a scriptural thing, right? Um, so we believe in knowledge. We believe in the value of knowledge. Um, and that's kind of where this talk comes from. These quotes that were read at the beginning uh, really captured a lot of this quote, but, uh, and I, I thought to use a couple of those in the talk, but I'm glad you read them. But uh, Abdu'l Baha, Baha'u'llah's son said, any religious belief which is not conformable with scientific proof and investigation is superstition. For true science is reason and reality, and religion is essentially reality and pure reason. Therefore, the two must correspond. So it's clear that Abdu'l Baha and Baha'u'llah and you know, the founders of this faith saw religion different than the average person out there. They saw it as a fundamental expression of the reality that exists, okay? So religion is not just a set of bunch of beliefs that people have and inherit from their parents and it divides the world. No, religion in its core has an essence of truth that is uh, fundamental to all reality. Okay, so, as I thought about this, so I came up with this title um, with some help, uh, Religion and Science is key, Two Keys to Reality, because I think, as this quote illustrates, the connector between religion and science is reality. And I don't think reality means something, you know, mysterious here. I think it's the reality we all experience on an everyday basis. What we experience is the world. I don't think they're talking about something mystical. I think they're talking about our world. As I began to think about this a little bit more though and, and sort of prepare my talk in more depth, uh, I, I kind of wanted to give it another title um, because if you think about it deeply, you recognize that religion and science are both expressions of, of us. Uh, they're both aspects of us. Religion doesn't exist out there. We talk about it as an external thing or science as an external thing or science says this. Well, science doesn't say anything. Humans say things based on their systematic studies that we call science about the reality of things. So religion and science are really reflections of who we are as human beings. And so in many ways, it's a how we view these, it really depends on how we view ourselves, right? Okay, so let's ask the first question, what is science? Um, so, you know, traditionally, uh, if you look at the great, and I'm going to go a little bit historically here, if you look at the great philosophies of the world, particularly the Greek philosophers, which had so much of an impact on Western civilization, in particular in Islamic civilization, um, you know, human beings were seen as animals, consistent with the rest of the world, but they were seen as also having this element that was transcendent to that, the rational mind. And so, you know, the philosopher Aristotle referred to humans as a rational animals. And so I want to explore a little bit because rationality is what leads into science. I want to explore this a little bit more. So 
you know, when human beings do what we call rationality, we do it in two basic forms. And that is deduction and induction. And then there was a shift historically on which one we sort of emphasized when the scientific revolution occurred. So deduction is classically the, the way this is described. Uh, it's the idea that if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C, right? So if one thing is true and another thing is true, then a corollary or, or a, uh, from that must then result that something else is true. So a lot of thinking uh, prior to the scientific revolution, and if you go back to the dialogues of Plato, you go back to even, this is Rene Descartes here on the slide, uh, who in his meditations um, in the uh, 17th century, you know, he starts with some sort of basic things he, he knows to be true and rationally deduces other things that must be true. And then of course, you know, in his famous statement, he says, where actually in the meditations, he had questioned his own existence, but he was able to get to this point through his rational deductions to say, I think, therefore I must exist. And that's this, it's a famous um, philosophical treatise because it really asks, it starts from a very skeptical position and move forward, but it's a classic sort of rationality deductive reasoning. Now a famous one, and um, that I wanna highlight because it's actually relevant to the Baha'i writing. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a sidebar here um, is the proof of God given by Avicenna. And so Avicenna was similar to Aristotle, probably one of the greatest um, philosophers of all time. He was, I think in many ways on a par with Aristotle. Um, he was a physician, uh, which is one of the reasons I like him. I used to give talks about evidence-based medicine and, um, and uh, you know, I would start with a quote from Avicenna uh, because he was felt to be the founder of what we now call evidence-based medicine. But nevertheless, uh, Ab Avicenna had learned multiple disciplines, including medicine, but he was best known as a, as a philosopher, as a classical philosopher. And his proof of God goes like this. He basically said, listen, all reality is composite. It's made up of parts. Everything you can think of is made up of parts. And therefore it should be regarded as contingent. It's dependent upon the parts. It depends on other things for its existence. So if all things are contingent, dependent, there must be something upon which they ultimately depend. And he defined that reality upon which all things depend as God. So um, by definition though, he reasoned qualities of God and it's not just this, there's other things. It's a very interesting proof actually and very uh, still very relevant to our thinking in the modern day about God. But he said, by definition, God cannot be composite, must be simple, and therefore must be one. So God, he basically, through this simple proof, uh, came to the idea of one God. Um, so I, I did that as a little sidebar, as sort of a classical example of a deductive proof. And that's the way people thought for, for years. And until, you know, probably the turn of the 1600s, uh, if you went to Cambridge or Oxford, um, I think this is Oxford here, uh, you would um, study Aristotle, you would study uh, the various proofs that came from the Middle Ages, from St. Thomas Aquinas and others, and you would be very much looking backward to study these deductive proofs about the nature of reality. What happened in the 1600s with the scientific revolution is they started to take a different perspective. I said, let's not reason <clears throat> from our own sort of uh, principles, Let's actually look at the world and observe it and develop theories and principles based on the observations that we see in the world. So this is a different type of reasoning. This is called induction, right? So we are, uh, a classic example of this is a crime scene or what I do in medicine. You get these various clues and you have to sort of fit together a narrative that explains all the clues. For me as a doctor, somebody comes in with sore throat and headache, and, and different things and these different signs and symptoms. And I have to try and come up with a, with a unifying explanation for what is the experience. And so that's, that's inductive reasoning. The problem with inductive reasoning under like, under, unlike deduction is it's not really a closed loop. There's always a possibility that you're wrong about your explanations for the uh, various observations that you, you, would, you have. So induction, um, though powerful, um, does have this aspect that it ultimately needs to be proven. 
And so that became the scientific, uh, that became the scientific exercise to prove the explanation, the beliefs that we had developed about the observations in reality through scientific studies and methods. And so, of course, you know, this was not really a new idea. Avicenna had basically said the same thing, but whatever happened in history, this led to the birth of an enormously productive enterprise we now call science. So studying the world and inducing truths from observations became the engine for the growth of human knowledge, an engine that we see manifest in every aspect of our lives today. Um, science developed consistent explanations for reality that were built into laws and principles that we know we could say were true because they were predictive of other things. So, you know, now if I want to see what the weather is tomorrow, I put up my, my app, I, I, I look and it's got, it's got a matched out, mapped out for 10 days, exactly what's going to happen. And that's because you know, the principles that underlying the study of environment and weather um, have, are, were discovered and were predictive of exactly what's going to happen. And every time the weather's right, all of those principles and laws upon which it's based get proven yet again to be true. Every time it's wrong, we blame it on the weather. Um, but over the subsequent centuries, science built up a base of objective knowledge. So this is different from subjective knowledge which may be true as well, but this was things that all of us could sort of agree on outside of ourselves were true. It didn't require as much subjectivity. There were statements about reality that could be shown to be true based on their ability to predict reality. And we know that cultures that embraced science in the 1600s, specifically Europe, soon began to dominate the world because they were technological advancements just outstripped everything, right? Now, I wanna, as a big fan of science, somebody who lives within a scientific community and, and, and loves it very much, I wanna speak and say that science itself has been a great unifier of humanity. It's created a space where people of all backgrounds can engage in a common set of standards and beliefs and build this beautiful structure of objective knowledge that we've learned about the world. There's nothing, as a religious person, nothing that keeps, and especially as a Baha'i, nothing that keeps me from fully embracing everything scientific. I wanted to take a moment to talk about something I was thinking about in terms of reality and knowledge. So, and this has come up a lot lately, and I think you all kind of know what I'm, re I'm referencing, but beliefs reflect our subjective perception of how the world works, how we think the rea what the reality of our world is. So there's a subjectivity to all our beliefs. We may share our beliefs with somebody else, but if they're subjective, those are called intersubjective beliefs. So a lot of people may uh, believe something together, but it's not an objective reality. It's a subjectively, intersubjectively belief. Now, beliefs, however, can be influenced by a host of other subjective factors, including emotion, social and cultural attachments, and our own inherent biases of various forms. Beliefs, on the other hand, can actually be the result of highly disciplined deductive analysis, as we will see. So beliefs can be um, very well formed and um, founded on, on very solid foundations, as any, any, any scientific theory starts out as a belief, right? And many of them are inherently true, and that's demonstrated over time. A belief that matches with reality, we call a truth, right? And it reflects knowledge. So, um, you know, beliefs may or may not be true when it matches with reality, we call it a truth and it reflects knowledge. And science has been the process of testing our beliefs in the real world to see if they match up with reality. Now, I wanna make a point, And I think this is a really important point because it, it establishes a connection between religion and science. True beliefs produce fruit, they're productive. Okay, all scientific beliefs are ultimately judged by whether they're predictive or productive. They're able to demonstrate that they can change reality or predict reality. So um, I am a big fan of coffee. That is my, it is my belief that it is good for me. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that is true, obviously. Uh, I feel good when I drink it. I feel better than when I, before I drank it. Uh, so I'd like to believe that it's good for me. I have an emotional attachment to coffee. Um, although I try to limit it to some degree. In any case, um, so what science does is, is take these beliefs and, and put it to the test 
and judges as to whether or not my belief is actually predictive of reality, right? And so this uh, example here of a study done of the probability of death over 20 years, 18 years, shows that the more, if you drink more than a cup a day of coffee, your probability of death goes down, right? And so there's other studies that have been shown this. So my belief in coffee is doing real work in the real world, okay? Drinking more coffee, my belief that that's true, does real work in the real world. And so true beliefs do real work in the real world. Okay, so I wanna point out a couple of things uh, that relate to the Baha'i faith and just, so one of them is that Baha'u'llah actually encouraged uh, this approach. And you know, it's interesting because Baha'u'llah sat on the, uh, the edge of many of these forces, the, the growth of the scientific revolution, his revelation came after the enlightenment in Europe, which was very um, substantial in its impact on um, uh, the birth of democratic societies and so forth. Uh, so Baha'u'llah came after all of this, but a lot of his followers, including some of the highly learned ones, were still steeped in some of the sort of deductive rationalist perspective upon which they were, they were raised. And so Baha'u'llah actually encouraged them. He said, look at the world and ponder a while upon it. He encouraged them to look at the world like Francis Bacon has. He said, it unveils the book of its own self before thine eyes and reveals that which thy Lord, the fashioner, the all informed hath inscribed therein. It will acquaint you thee with that which is within it and upon it, and will give you such clear explanations as to make you independent of every eloquent expounder. So Baha'u'llah encourages us to do this, but you know, it's interesting. He says, the world will tell you what God, is, God has put in it, right? So uh, science for Baha'u'llah, and as we see, is not a breakaway from religion, but really an expression of, of religious belief. So Baha'u'llah also talks about how, and he encouraged his followers to train their children in what he referred to as sciences that are productive and are of benefit to the human race. So there's a link between truth and productive value, right? And Baha'u'llah said, you know, those things that are productively valuable will be beneficial to the human race and you should study those. So it's famous quote, knowledge is as a wings to man's life and a ladder for his ascent. Its acquisition is incumbent on everyone. The knowledge of such sciences, however, should be acquired as can profit the peoples of the world and not those that begin with words and end with words. You know, this connection between productive knowledge and um, sort of, and reality, I think is sort of an old one uh, because, you know, they ask Jesus how to know true believers, if you will. And he said, by their fruit, you shall recognize them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then by their fruits, you will recognize them. So this idea that good beliefs, correct beliefs, true beliefs produce fruits in the world of reality is, is a strong one and one is also supported by religion. Okay, so there has been in this, the reason I'm giving this talk and the reason this is important to many people is that religion is kind of in a bad state. It is not uh, necessarily um, uh, in its heyday, if you will. Um, and, you know, Baha'is, I think we're here to help, help improve that situation. But this is an image uh, from the Reason Rally uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, in which uh, folks gather together to uh, promote reason. And uh, it's also sort of an a atheist materialist uh, rally. And uh, this, they bring signs and so forth. And um, this gentleman, I was struck by his, his shirt. It says, you know, atheist in science we trust. And I'm very sympathetic in many ways to what's happening here. Um, I think that, you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of claims and beliefs, and there's a strong desire to found our beliefs on objective reality. Uh, religion has an inherent subjectivity to it. Um, and for that reason, a lot of folks, including many prominent scientists, um, have trouble finding value in religion because they're so 
they've gotten, they're so raised with so much um, focus on objective, um, objective truths that can be demonstrated uh, in reality. Um, and so, you know, since God is not one of those concepts, a lot of them are sort of moving away from religion. And I'm sympathetic to this view because I understand the thirst and the yearning for us to be able to come together on objective knowledge, like, like scientists do. A lot of these scientists who come out with atheist perspectives are used to the scientific community. They're used to that grounding of knowledge. Um, and then they look at religion and it just seems to be all this subjective nonsense. Now, we should note though, that we are not living in the heyday of religion. Um, the religions of the past uh, were tied to different um, perspectives of the world uh, that have been debunked by science. Um, and uh, so, you know, the world is not 6,000 years old, for instance. Um, and so that view of the world has been debunked is maybe a strong word, but, you know, it's contrary to science. And so um, there's some of that worldview shift, but also the individual religions themselves, the great religions that were so substantial and so important in the birth and growth of human consciousness um, have divided into competing sects. They are more tribal than the tribalism they sought to replace uh, in the past. And, you know, Baha'u'llah tells us this is why his revelation is here in order to bring back into the world uh, what true religion is all about, but also to unify the older religions and help them understand the foundations at their roots and to get rid of all of this tribalism that we see in religion. So I, I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the folks that feel this way. And I think in some ways the Baha'i faith is here to solve the same problems. Um, so, but the Baha'is have a very different perspective. So this, as the quotes have demonstrated so far, but Abdu'l Baha Baha'u'llah says, said, son said the acquisition of science and the perfection of arts are actually acts of worship, right? So there's not this dichotomy between science and religion. It's an embracing of both. And so how do we do that? How do Baha'is or how did Abdu'l Baha and Baha'u'llah help us understand the nature of religion and the nature of reality so that we're able to embrace both science and religion. So there's a story of Einstein that's really interesting to me because you know, as we've evolved in science, we've, we basically have gotten used to this idea. And this happens all the time with me and working with my, the medical residents and so forth. You know, we, we ask a patient, how should we treat this patient? We ask a question, how should we treat this patient? And um, everybody cites articles you know, from different sort of objective sources, inductive, studies that have been done that have demonstrated the value of this or the that. And we've gotten so used to doing that. But at the root of all science is something far more fundamental and significant. And that is where I'm trying to get at when I say that science is ultimately a reflection of us. It's far more creative, even mystical in a sense. So there's the wonderful story of Einstein in when he um, after he had uh, published his, I've forgotten whether it was the general or the special theory of relativity, it was one of them. Uh, but yet it wasn't yet proven in the sense that it hadn't been, the experiments hadn't been done. And so there's this story of him uh, being in his lab or wherever in his office and one of his students came running in with a publication and said, you know, Professor Einstein, your, 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 um, your theory has been validated by uh, this new study that has been done. And he was completely uninterested. For him, he said, my theory was validated a long time ago. And I don't think this was a manifestation of ego. He, was, he, he had, in his own mind, it was clear to him that what he had developed was true. And Einstein has a lot to say about this. But so he didn't rely on science to prove it, if you will. He relied on his own sense of deduction and intuition. And he, he says in one of his quotes, he says, the truly great advances in our understanding of nature originated in a manner almost diametrically opposed to induction. He said the intuitive grasp of the essentials of long, large complex sets of facts leads the scientist to the postulation of a hypothetical basic law. From that basic law, he derives his conclusion as completely as possible in a purely logical deductive manner. 
So for Einstein, his theory was true because it could be deduced from known truths, but it also explained reality in a much more coherent way. It explained more observations in a much more coherent way than anything that had existed before. And to him, it almost could not could not not be true, right? It had to be true on that basis. There was, a, and he talks about this, this sense of intuition. So um, this gets to, I think, a fundamental aspect of how Baha'is or how Baha'is are taught to think about uh, the human being. Um, yes, we are, we have animal aspects. Our rational mind is, um, something transcendent that exists within us. And science is a method by which we can put to test our philosophical deductions, okay? But science is the server of the rational mind. The rationality comes first, okay? So there's a lovely passage from Abdu'l Baha where he says, it is evident and true, though most astounding, that in humans, there is present this supernatural force or faculty, which discovers the realities of things and possesses the power of idealization, idealization and intellection. It is capable of discovering scientific laws and science we know is not a tangible reality. Science exists in the mind of man as an ideal reality. The mind itself is an ideal reality and not tangible. So, you know, Abdu'l Baha is saying is while science makes sense of the material world and many of its methods sort of are materialistic in a sense, at fundamentally what is happening here is that a, a spiritual aspect of humanity that is supernatural compared to the rest of the world. And I think supernatural, he means compared to the kingdoms of animals, plants, and minerals, for instance. You know, it's supernatural to them. And it's supernatural to the other laws that govern the universe. Right? This gives human beings free will and it gives human beings the ability to abstractly think and it gives human beings the ability to um, be creative, including in doing science. And Abdu'l Baha says that this aspect that produces science is inherently spiritual and indeed supernatural. So in the sense that it transcends nature. So. You know, I think one of the things that scientists get into a little bit um, is a materialist perspective. And I want, to, I want to highlight the fact that all religions and many of the great philosophies of the world, uh, particularly before the modern day, had a different model of reality than many scientists have come to adapt. So, you know, when science came on the, uh, on the scene with its uh, approach, inductive empirical approach, we kind of world, look at the world like an old car sitting in the grass, right? Um, and let's say we came upon this old car and we wanted to figure out how it worked. We're gonna break it down into its component parts. We're gonna be reductionist, if you will. And we were gonna assume that everything that we needed to explain the reality of that car was in the car. So everything's there. We're gonna break it down and we're not gonna posit any other forces that exist outside of the car we're just going to say, we're going to break it down and we're going to build it back up and we're going to figure out why, how all the parts work and we're going to come up with different laws based on those parts and so forth. And that's what science did and has been doing for the last 200 years, finding that old car in the woods. But you know, it's interesting. And, and by the way, let me just point out that, you know, that was explicitly what the founders of science were doing. You know, uh, Descartes talked about mechanistic explanations. He was very interested in machines. Um, you know, they viewed the world as a machine, right? We, our machines for the modern day are not the, the old cars that sit in the woods, but, the, but computers, right? And how are computers structured? Well, they're structured in a little bit different model, right? Computers are structured where there's, there's two aspects to a computer. There's a hardware and there's a software. And the hardware, um, is you know, let's say we're living in this computer, right? We're going to see the hardware doing its thing, but there's something abstract to the hardware, a software that is really the driving force. And that's actually what's really important, you know? So the laws of nature in a sense are a software, but 
religion asks us to think even beyond the laws of nature and say that abstract to the reality we experience is a software which we're living in the hardware is a software beyond that, okay? And so this is kind of the modern way of thinking about the world, right? We all think in terms of computers and the world is a video game and all of these other things, but it's a different model of reality. And it's a model of reality that's actually where I'm trying to get with what Baha'is believe, but also all religious people fundamentally. So what Baha'u'llah taught is that the world we experience has become created by the unknowable God. Unknowable because God does not live in the reality that we live in, nor could our minds possibly encompass the reality of God. It would be the same as a created painting uh, encompassing the reality of the painter. It can't be done. Um, and so uh, that's, a, that's a starting point to religion for Baha'is is this basic understanding that we can't understand God, right? So what does it mean to understand God? What is, it, what is our reality about? Of course, we do believe as Baha'is, all religions teach, that it is a created reality, that there's a creator that gives meaning, ultimate meaning to the world. So Baha'u'llah said that, you know, what we, what we experience in the world are the expression of the will of God as expressed in all creation. And there's different terms that are used in the Baha'i writings for this fundamental reality of all existence. Uh, in one, they talk, it talks about the primal will of God, but Baha'u'llah also talks about the word of God. And it's, many of you may know the passage in the, in the Bible, in the gospel of John, the beginning, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and so forth. And you know, that ultimately becomes Jesus, Jesus himself in that paragraph. Um, the, so Baha'u'llah is using the same idea and saying that what is, what is, um, what we can understand is the underlying logos of creation, the primal will, um, the force that we will experience. I, I give an example in other talks. It's like the paintbrush in the world of creation, right? But look at how Baha'u'llah expresses this, how he tells us what this is. He says it is higher and far superior to that which the senses can perceive, for it is sanctified from any property of substance. It transcends the limitation of known elements and is exalted above all essential and recognized substances. It became manifest without any syllable or sound and is none other but the command of God which pervades all created things. So I wanna make two points on this. One is that Baha'is believe in basically two supernatural things. Uh, one is our own minds uh, that I highlighted before and our own souls. And I'll get into this in a little bit. The second is that the reality outside of us is also supernatural in its essence. What we experience is nature at its foundation is what Baha'u'llah is talking about as being an expression of the word of God. But that's not a substance, right? It's not an element. It's not, it's, it's an essence that exists beyond those things, right? So I had a patient come in to see me and he was a really nice guy and we had a nice talk and I liked him very much and I still like him very much. And he, um, so in his first time he had come to see me, we, I was getting to know him and he said he was a retired minister. And I had noted that in the chart. And so he came back to see me again. And um, uh, at one point in the discussion, he said, you know, I have to fly on an airplane and I'm, I'm really nervous about flying on the plane. And I said to him, you know, thinking as a minister, I said, well, you have to trust in God. And he said, well, I don't believe in God. <laughs> and I said, but you're a minister. He said, oh, I was a Unitarian minister. We don't have to believe in God. Uh, and so we both had kind of a chuckle. And then um, he said, you know, on your website, uh, he said, I looked you up on the internet. You were the, you were the lead of the Center for Evidence-Based Practice. So what's the evidence for God? How could you believe something that doesn't have any evidence? And it was a very interesting discussion. And, and you know, for me, the evidence is everything because this is what Baha'u'llah tells us. Everything is an evidence. It's not any one thing. It's not a miracle. It's not some special thing or when you win the lottery, that's not because of God, right? That's 
everything that exists is an expression of God. That's the Baha'i understanding. So it's not, um, supernatural is not the kind of supernatural things people believed in the past where there are ghosts and goblins and you know other things that cause the weather to change and all this other stuff. No, the reality itself is a, an expression of a supernatural reality that underlies everything. And you know, um, every, every beautiful thing we see in the world and even some of the not beautiful things are an expression of God. And that's the Baha'i understanding to my understanding. But you know, if you look at a human being, we're, we're not just rational minds, we're far more than that, right? What's, what's connected us in our societies, those that have been stable, are our commitment to certain principles, uh, moral principles uh, that we call values. And you know, philosophers traditionally segregate knowledge into knowledge of facts and knowledge of values. And the reason philosophers make that distinction is that we're made up of those two things, right? We're made up of an aspect of us that is focused on facts. And that's, that's what the rational mind is all about and what we've been talking about. Um, but there's also an aspect of us that is focused on values. And so the Baha'i writings focus a lot on this other aspect, right? This other aspect of us that ultimately is the source of stable and peaceful societies. Because you know we have good examples of societies that are very advanced scientifically and a threat to the rest of the world because they don't have the right values, right? So um, that just simply reflects us and who we are as human beings. We have this animalistic nature, we have irrational minds, but we also have this other side. And the Baha'i writings for um, use the term and use many terms, but one of them is the term heart. And you know, the, when the Baha'i writings use the term heart, it's not like the Hollywood heart kind of thing, where you love and, you know, it's not all about love between humans, but rather it's, it's this, um, it's, a, it's a spiritual aspect uh, of us that is actually somewhat separate from our rational minds, or at least a different aspect of us. So I thought of different descriptions and came up with this, that the human heart in the Baha'i writings is the seat of our values and the most sublime aspects of our being, okay? It desires for sublimity. It desires for transcending um, the contention and conflict of the world. It desires to go higher. It is the source of art and a love for all that is not tangible. So rationality is ultimately founded on the ability and distinctive aspect of rationality is that it is abstract. We are able to abstract. This is the sort of the correlate within us, but now focused on our, our heart. We're not able to just think abstractly, but to feel abstractly. If that human heart is directed towards material desires and stays in that realm, our animalistic desires, our own ego and so forth, uh, we live in that realm. But we can reach up with that heart to more abstract and sublime realms that are our true home. And Baha'u'llah tells us in many of his passages writing, it's really worthwhile to explore this in Baha'u'llah's writings because it's a major aspect of everything he taught that we need to find this aspect within us and find that abstract love that we call that he calls the love of God and historically has been known in Islam and Christianity as the love of God. And in one beautiful passage, Baha'u'llah says, for every one of you, his paramount duty is to choose for himself that on which no other may infringe and none usurp from him. Such a thing, and to this the Almighty is my witness, is the love of God, could you but perceive it. Build for yourselves such houses that the rain and floods can never destroy which shall protect you from the changes and chances of the world. So Baha'u'llah asking us to find this thing called the love of God. And what is the love of God? It's a good question, actually. And it would, but to me, it is the love of all that is sublime and beautiful and just and right and true. The love of justice is an expression of the love of God. The love of peace is an expression of the love of God. The love of compassion is an expression of the love of God. The love of mercy is an expression of the love of God. 
You know, the Quran, every chapter in the Quran starts in the starts by saying, in the name of God, the compassionate, the all merciful, right? Most compassionate, the all merciful. Um, the re religions of humanity have taught us what the love of God is all about by, by telling us what the spiritual characteristics that are associated with loving God are. So, um, and Baha'u'llah tells us that the purpose of our lives is ultimately to find this love and to infuse our hearts with this love. This abstract love, right? I mean, this is the correlate to pure rationality, right? In a beautiful passage, Baha'u'llah says, all that is in heaven and in earth, I have ordained for thee except the human heart. This is God speaking directly to us. All that is in heaven, I have ordained for thee except the human heart, which I have made the habitation of my beauty and glory. Yet thou didst give my home and dwelling to another than me. And whenever the manifestation of my holiness sought his own abode, a stranger found he there, and homeless hastened to the sanctuary of the beloved. Baha'u'llah throughout his writings tells us that the love of God is seeking a home within our hearts, right? This abstract love of all that is right and true, and we are focused on other stuff, right? Um, the uh, hidden words of Baha'u'llah is how I discovered these ideas um, by reading them uh, challenge me on a deep level. It, it, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, Baha'u'llah describes it as a sum, summation of all of the great religions of the past. Um, and in one of those hidden words, and they're all framed with God speaking directly to the human spirit, the human soul. He says, veiled in my immemorial being and the ancient eternity of my essence. This is God speaking to humanity. I knew my love for thee, therefore I created thee, have engraved on thee mine image and revealed to thee my beauty. Some of you may recognize in this the same idea that it is expressed in the Hebrew Bible um, and in the New Testament, that human beings have been created in the image of God, right? And that's what Baha'u'llah's saying, right? Um, and then he says, I've revealed to you my beauty, which this is what, how Baha'is see religions of the past, how religion. Fundamentally, religion, in a very deep, mystical way, has been throughout history the revelation of God's beauty to humanity so that we can love God. And so when Baha'u'llah says every one of these religions is the way of God that connects this world to the realms above, meaning our job as human beings is to get out of our materiality and connect with this higher reality. The way of God that connects this world with the realms above, the standards of his truth, right? And so that every religion, every revelation reveal, right? Is revealing a new connection uh, for human beings with God in the way that we can understand it, in the way that we can understand God within our own reality. So religion is, a deep and beautiful thing, as deep and beautiful as pure science and pure rationality are. They are the, it is the highest expression of humanity, of what we can be as human beings, is pure religion. And that's what is revealed in the revelations of God. Now we mess it up. I mean, we become tribal about these religions and we take all kinds of things and we, we, we completely mess it up. But there's not a person on earth that hasn't read these words and not been moved on some level. It's because they're speaking from a connection of the, a place that is higher and it seems so familiar and so close. So Baha'u'llah then tells us that actually whatever, everything on the earth, um, once we develop this connection with the love of God, we see as a reflection of the beauty of God. He says, whatever on the earth is a direct re revelation within it. So there's a revelations of God. We talked about the great religions of humanity, but there's also this universal revelation that everything reveals the attributes of God. So whatever is on the earth is a direct evidence of the revelation within it of the names and attributes of God. Inasmuch as within every atom are enshrined the signs that bear eloquent testimony to that most great light. 
but for the potency of that revelation, no being could ever exist. How resplendent the luminaries of knowledge that shine in an atom, and how vast the oceans of wisdom that surge within a drop. And you know, science has allowed us and helped us to understand those oceans of wisdom that surge within that drop, right? So a human being um, is both science and religion, right? We are rational mind that does science, but we are also this other aspect, this heart, the source of love and justice and beauty and truth and our love of truth and art and everything else, right? And religion is intended to keep us in that sublime realm. Now, it's interesting because, so, you know, this aspect of us is supernatural. It's not made up, it's made up, it's not, well, it's not made up of the elements of our world. Baha'u'llah gives analogies, very many analogies in the writings. Abdul Baha does the same. Um, similar idea to, I think, music and how music is played on an instrument, but is separate from the instrument, um, but needs the instrument in order to manifest itself in the world. That's what our soul does. Uh, it needs the instrument of our bodies in order to manifest its presence in the world. Um, or Abdu'l-Baha'u'llah also, Baha also gives the example as the human soul being uh, like a, a mirror uh, that reflects the light or the body being the mirror and the soul being the light that is reflected. And, you know, until the mirror is developed, the soul can't fully manifest itself, right? Or the light can't fully manifest itself. So uh, it's this connection between something that is abstract and something that is concrete. But Baha'u'llah says something else that's really important. He says our souls, these, this inner aspect of us, is invested with an immense potentiality. Um, there's a lovely uh, book out by Dr. Michael Penn, a, a dear friend, and some of you may know Dr. Penn. Uh, he just wrote a book. I encourage you to find it on Amazon. It's called The Oneness of the Human Spirit. It's quite beautiful. But uh, Michael gives a beautiful, he has a paragraph in there. He talks about how, who would have thought that a, a baby who can't even sip upright or manage its own secretions would eventually come to the point where it could be a transplant surgeon and transplant something, right, within another body or do something so refined and sophisticated, it's hard to imagine, right? So the, it's this difference between what exists in potential form and when that manifests, how brilliant it is. And Baha'u'llah tells us that our souls have this enormous potential if we were to actually focus on their development. And he says the human soul is in its essence one of the signs of God, a mystery among his mysteries. Within it lies concealed that which the world is now utterly incapable of apprehending. Human beings and human spirit and souls will continue to develop through education, through our own rational minds, but also through the forces of religion to, to grow and do, build societies and build civilization that we can't even imagine, much like we've done in the modern day, but that's gonna continue, right? So the Baha'i faith gives uh, a, um, a way of understanding truth that I think is unique. And the more I've thought about it over the years, I have in my mind come up with two metaphors, analogies. I'm actually not sure what the difference between those two things are. Um, but, well, I guess I do. But two metaphors. One is that knowledge, both spiritual and intellectual, can be viewed as like a series of flower pots. That every flower pot is good, right? So if you're a person that doesn't believe in religion, but you believe in science and you believe in rationality, you're going to grow in that flower pot and you're going to reach a certain height and you're going to do pretty well. But if you stay in that pot and you don't explore outside of that pot, you're not going to grow anymore. There's a limit to your growth as a human being because Religion cares us about us as humans, right? It's ultimately about the growth of us as human, human beings. That's what it cares about. And so a, a, a person who believes in one of the, maybe, maybe one of the older religions of humanity and also science, they're in a particular pot, right? But, you know, there's more, ex every religion that's come to humanity has grown upon the truths that were in the previous religion. So every one of them represents bigger pots. And so, 
you know, I see truth in this way, you know, they're all, everything's true, right? Honest, it's just not the level of truth at which it exists. A similar idea is these Russian dolls, you know, that you, you, have, you, you kind of uncover the different layers. So science is true. It's just not the whole truth, right? Different religions are true. It's just not the whole truth. There's, there's an expansiveness to reality itself and our ability to understand reality that we haven't even comprehended. So, um, you know, this is how Baha'is, I think, marry these ideas of a fundamentally, profoundly spiritual religion with a belief in science, that they're both reflective of our souls, basically, uh, an expression of the most sublime aspects of our being. So I wanted to stop with, end with this quote because um, it's a very powerful quote to me because it expresses the nature of the reality in which we live um, and how some people think of religion as sort of something that holds people back. And, and I, I'm trying to get around that idea, but this quote tells us, I think, about the expansiveness of the world. Um, Baha'u'llah describing God in relation to creation says, a drop of the billowing ocean the billowing ocean, right? You have this image of this ocean, these waves crashing, right? Of his endless mercy, a drop of that billowing ocean of his endless mercy has ordained, adorned all creation with the ornament of existence. You just take a drop of that and he's given all creation the ornament of existence. And the breath wafted from his peerless paradise has invested all beings with the robe of sanctity and glory a sprinkling of the unfathomed deep of his sovereign and all pervasive will has out of other nothingness called into being a creation which is infinite in its range and deathless in its duration. The wonders of his bounty can never cease. The stream of his merciful grace can never be arrested. The process of his creation hath had no beginning and can have no end. So what we're exploring with our souls that have all this potential is a creation infinite in its range and deathless in its duration with an expansiveness that we can't even imagine. So um, I'm still doing Sifter of Dust for those of you. We've taken a biff pause for the last year for reasons, uh, just busyness and job responsibilities and other things, but we are rebooting. Uh, so we will be rebooting soon. And with that, I'm going to end my talk Thank you all so much for coming and um, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Williams. I really love how you explained such a complex, nuanced topic. I really, I, I really think we all benefited from it. Thank you. Um, so if anyone has questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. So the first question is, could you repeat the name of the book by Michael Penn that you mentioned? Oh, it's called Our Common Humanity, Reflections on the Reclamation of the Human Spirit. Um, I read it a couple weeks ago on vacation. It was, it was lovely. It's very nice. Our common humanity. And if you read it and you like it, Dr. Penn asked me to please write a review. <laughs> Great. We'll do that. Thank you. So could you please tell us some more about this supernatural force or faculty which helps us discover the realities and reveal the pearls of wisdom? That's a good question. Uh, that's, that's what we're trying to explore when we're doing both religion and science. Um, you know, um, one, I, 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 can, I can tell you various things that are in the Baha'i writings about the nature of our uh, reality. One of the things that Baha'u'llah says, which actually is, I found very compelling, um, and it's a passage in Gleadings in, that starts, and some of you may know it, where uh, it starts, consider the, the rational faculty which God hath invested the reality of humanity. Uh, and Baha'u'llah then goes on to talk about the rational faculty. Wert thou to ponder in thine heart from now until the end that hath no end, and with all the concentrated intelligence and understanding which the greatest of minds have attained in the past or will attain in the future, this divinely ordained and subtle reality. Thou wilt fail to comprehend its mystery or to appraise its virtue. Um, he says that Abdu'l Baha says something very interesting in another passage of his. He, he, and I was going to, I put a compass on one of my slides for the intention to make this point. 
He says human beings sit at the 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 um, at the tip of a at the tip of a compass, and all our explorations are just around that compass, and the compass is is the is us, you know, and we're we're the more we explore the world, the more we're basically real, revolving around our own reality. The more we're actually just exploring our own selves. Um, a, the rational faculty of which Baha'u'llah says is fundamentally unknowable to us. And I always found that to be very interesting that because there's a, there's a great deal of science and philosophy, the philosophy of the mind and so forth. And I read a book a few months ago, oh, about a year ago, I guess, about how the philosophies of mind have evolved. And nobody knows, you know? So nobody knows how this is. We have all these theories, but nobody really knows. And so, you know, Baha'u'llah is basically telling us that ultimately, the, that you know we're we're using this rational faculty, but it's like it's 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 hidden within us in such a uh, we're never going to actually encompass it with our own minds because it's a sign of God. So the next question is: In the Valley of Search, Baha'u'llah writes, "For those who seek the Kaaba, for us rejoice in the tidings. In our ways will we guide them." As a scientist, can you comment on the meaning of "In our ways will we guide them"? Uh, for those who seek the Kaaba. Right. Uh, in our ways, we will surely guide them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, of course, you know, Baha'u'llah in the Seven Valleys is writing to a Muslim man. Uh, the Kaaba signifies the most holy site in all of Islam. Uh, symbolically, uh, within mystical literature of Islam, the Kaaba became um, the sacred part of our own selves. Right. And so um, for those who seek that, um, in our ways, we will assured to guide them. And, you know, so this is, I think, a promise that's given to us throughout Baha'u'llah's writings in many ways. Uh, and that is, if we go, if we set ourselves upon this path of trying to understand the love of God and set upon this path of the love of God, that we will be guided, uh, that we will be, um, it, it is the path of what we sometimes refer to as salvation, right? Salvation protects you from the the difficulties of the world, right? And so you're able, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna get cancer or you're not gonna have a heart attack or any of those other things, right? That's not what it means. It means that the ultimate development of human beings requires us to put faith in something that abstract to ourselves. And that if we put our trust in that and follow in its way, we will reach our destination. That's what it means to me. I don't wanna be interpreting the writings for others. Just Great, saying. thank you. Um, there's a question about like, what's your take on the relationship between the physical and spiritual heart? Or is there a relationship? Oh, you know, it's interesting. Um, there is, there's this whole field of psycho neuroimmunology and how, um, you know, what we believe and how we perceive the world has an impact upon our human health. There's no question there. There's some aspect of that. Um, placebo effect is an effect of that. Uh, which is, placebo effect is not an insignificant thing. It's 50% of pain can be controlled by placebos um, and probably is. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there's, there's an aspect of, of this that definitely pertains to human health as well. Um, and, um, you know, I had a, a Baha'i friend, I won't tell you his name, but uh, he contacted me about having an orthopedic surgery and um, at my institution, he wanted to have it there. So he, he said, there's one surgeon at your hospital that does bilateral hip replacements at the same time. And uh, I said, I've never heard of anybody getting their hip, bi both their hips replaced at the same time. He said, it's possible, it can be done and I wanna do it. And so this is a very prayerful person, someone who has served the Baha'i faith and for years. And I've watched people go through knee replacements and hip replacements for years, and consulting on them. And so they were all in a lot of pain, right? And this gentleman got his surgery. And the next morning I went to visit him and he is sitting up in his chair, ready to walk the halls. And he had stopped using the narcotics they'd given him from the surgery. From that point on, he did Tylenol only. And uh, he's like, he was such a strong person. You know, he exhibited such a strength of character he 
and I, you know, I thought about this and I thought, you know, over years of sort of spiritual practice, he had really developed a confidence in his own abilities to manage his problems, you know? And uh, so, you know, religion gives us that. One of the things that Baha'u'llah talks about in his writings um, is that religion gives us courage um, and uh, eliminates fear. Baha'u'llah himself, I love these stories of Baha'u'llah and how fearless he was. He really didn't care what was going to happen to him. After all, they didn't care uh, because they had such a power within them. They're, they were so developed in their own individual uh, souls that they weren't afraid anymore. Um, I guess one question or thought I had was like, I really liked your clarification of, you know, what God is and what Baha'is believe God is and that he is unknowable and that he is reflected in reality. And even using the word he is, you know, misleading. Um, but could you kind of like expand on the concept of how can we love something or some essence that's unknowable? I mean, what, what does that mean then to say we're monotheistic or all religions believe in a God? I mean, what does that mean? Oh, uh, that's a very interesting question, Dainana, because, um, I know exactly what it means to believe in God and to love God, but it's very hard to explain to somebody else. Um, uh, the, there is an innate aspect of us that is attached to sublime things. And it's like we have an innate rationality, right? It's there, we're given it to it from birth, right? We're able to, little, little children are able to reason through things, right? And in, in sometimes in very sophisticated ways. They develop their ability to do that over time as they get more experience and so forth. But, you know, I remember as a little child, you know, some of my early reasonings about the way the world works were spot on, you know, and I, I've heard other people say this. Um, and so we are bored with these uh, native abilities. But I think there is, it is, it seems to be evidently true and that human beings have a natural desire to worship the sublime reality of the essence of all things. It ex expresses itself in so many different ways and so many different forms. Sometimes on the lower level of expression, it's worshiping a, an idol, you know? But as what has happened as the, you've seen the religions develop over time and the revelations of God have come to humanity is the nature of God has become more abstract. And um, the nature of God has become more abstract, but as we've become more abstract, we are, we've been able to do more stuff and build, and science is founded on abstractness, right? In fact, you could say that monotheism, the idea of an abstract transcendent God that wasn't embodied in any particular idol or, or lived in any mountain, right, was, was actually uh, the basis of science, um, because you had to be able to think that way in order to be able to even start to do science. And so, um, you, you know, uh, ultimately though, my experience of God, this Baha'u'llah tells us this, he says, you know, as we get closer to God, we're really getting closer to our own essence and the, the sublime aspect of our own essence, right? Um, and we objectify it outside of ourselves, but in reality, it's an inner journey. And I love that somebody mentioned the Seven Valleys because um, Seven Valleys is awesome. Uh, it's in the, the call of the divine beloved. You know, there's this mystical literature of Islam that was completely missed in the West. It just doesn't exist, oh, except in very small amounts. But it was a really, Islam was such a, a diverse um, and, and eclectic culture, you know, that bring, brought in so many different aspects. And when Baha'u'llah wrote to the Islamic uh, mystics, you know, there's such a richness in that. He pulls in there, some, you, you know how much, how rich the history there was. But, you know, Baha'u'llah in that tablet is talking about the development of an individual spirit closer to God. At, you know, the ultimate uh, thing is the station of absolute nothingness. <laughs> right? That you reach a stage where all ego is just burnt away and, and you're just, just a reflection of, of all that is good and right and true. And, you know, that's what we're trying to get to as human beings. And that's the path that Baha'u'llah is trying to push us on. Again, you asked a question and I went off and I don't know. 
party. But, you know, I, the one thing I will say, you know, speaking to folks that, you know, are skeptical of religion, you know, I, I hear about religion in the modern day and what's on the public and what I hear other friends express. And it's, they just don't have any experience with this. I mean, this is, this is the beauty of religion, what we're talking about, like reading the Seven Valleys, reading the Hidden Words. We're so blessed as Baha'is to have these texts, to be able to study them, because otherwise religion seems like just a bunch of nonsense, and it's not. It's the essence of everything. Thank you. Yes, no, that was definitely what, <clears throat> just wanted you to expand on that topic of, it's very, yeah, like you said, religion's very mis misconstrued, you know, current society. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's important to note that the Baha'i writings explicitly state that knowing God is knowing your own self, that it's an inner journey. And the manifestations of God to come to sort of guide us along that inner journey, inspire us, and represent, you know, represent the outer aspect of that inner journey. Um, and, uh, but that's what it's all about. And I, you know, Baha'is are non-political. Uh, we don't engage in any of the dissensions and the conflicts and the contentions. We could, but I think that the reason we don't, um, and the reason Baha'u'llah didn't want us to, is so that we could protect religion and our religion from these forces, so that it remains this universal, beautiful thing that everyone can experience, irrespective of their individual sort of beliefs about this or that that we end up fighting about. One of the things that about of science that um, we're able to do is prove our um, theories to be true. And we're able to prove those theories, as I said, because they produce fruit in the real world, right? And I made that point in order to make this one and I didn't make it. Um, and that is that what we believe is Baha'is and about religion, I think we're at the stage where Einstein was just before um, his, his theory was proven, right? Because we're still at this early stage of Baha'u'llah's revelation and, and our understanding of it, but we all believe it based on something within us. It's both coherent and rational and everything else, but there's this spirituality that's just incredible. But we're still early and, you know, it hasn't quite been proven, right? Uh, because it hasn't been manifested in the world to produce beautiful fruits. It hasn't produced a civilization yet like Islam did or hasn't produced a civilization like Christianity did. And so, you know, but it will. And, and I feel that. Um, and, but, you know, ultimately what we believe, if, it, if it's true in your own lives, um, you know, you need to explore it and apply it to your life, uh, apply its principles to your life and see what it does to your life. Um, because it's within that testing, it's a form of, it's a scientific form. It does it produce fruit. And, you know, Baha'u'llah said, the essence of faith is fewness of words and abundance of deeds, right? It's the same thing in science. You know, this cup of coffee, I know it to be true, but it proves because in reality, it produced fruit. It's that our deeds must flow from all of this and produce fruit in the real world. And then we know things to be true because they produce something that is beautiful and good. Sorry, I wanted to make that point. No, that's great. Thank you. Well, I think that's the end of our question. So thank you so much, Dr. Williams. And we have this talk recorded so we can share with our friends who weren't here. Um, this was very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so next week, our speaker will be Dr. Elena Mostukova, and her topic will be, what is the Baha'i vision for collective healing and security? So again, this is every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I've put the link to our contact form in the chat if you're not on our, on our mailing list already. Blessed is the sport and the house and the place and the city and the heart and the mountain and the refuge.
his praise glorify ooh, ooh, ooh. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye.